I'm going to demonstrate and show you how to create an isometric sketch, very similar to the way obliques are created, and in fact, even use the same steps. I also have the same types of rules or requirements you ought to follow or try to consider. Isometrics are simple. Like an oblique, we're looking at a pictorial, top, a front, and often a right side or left side view, some type of profile. You have to remember that with an oblique, we're looking straight on the front face. However, with an isometric, we're looking at a corner edge. Isometrics and obliques both look like a perspective, which again, we'll talk about a little later. Uh, but they're not quite the same. Remember that with isometric and oblique, we deal with having parallel edges. So height lines, or what we'll refer to a lot of times as vertical lines, should be parallel to each other. Width lines, also known as horizontal lines, should also be parallel to each other. And depth lines, uh, which we'll almost always refer to as depth lines, should be parallel, at least to each other. All right, now I'll show you how to do it. So you'll see that using the same handout you have, I'll create an isometric sketch of this object. Something to note about this object is that they've decided to make it three units tall by one and a half deep and six wide. We know this is the front face because it's a pretty stable position for this object. It's also a very natural position for this object and it has the longest dimension shown. Now this could be tipped up on its side, but it would fall over a lot easier than if it were laying on the longer dimension. So we refer to this as the front, this is the top, this is a side view or a right side face, profile is another word for it. Here we also have an angled face, a non-parallel, a canted, a chamfered, a slanted, face all mean the same thing. We'll leave it blank when we tonal shade just like the top. They've done us a lot of work already. They've basically created the box for us. So we just need to do the sub step of it. Now you'll notice that they went one to one. One unit on the object is one unit on the grid in the box. So from this point all the way over to here is from this point all the way over here. I would go up one, two, three, one, two, three, all the way up to the top. Connecting that together so that I create a grid or a, a face. A grid will come next. I can also do the right side face. And then the top face only requires this last point. To be able to grid it off, I need to find where are my points of interest here. Now, there are one, two, three, four, five, six units. So I could grid that, and that can be useful for more complex objects. This object isn't very complex. What I really need to know is where do things change? Most of this object is a surface face. The big surface face for the top, big surface face for the front, and big surface face for the right. This angled face, however, has some interior edges and will only be created at the end. So, this edge is important and this edge is important. Not only is it the beginning and end of that angled face, but it also helps me identify where these points are here and here. So, this point, starting on that top edge from the far left corner, right here, is three units towards the right. One, two, three. I can also look at going back one and a half units along the isometric grid line. One and a half units. From the right edge, I can go up on the front face one and a half. Now this is tricky. Notice it's one and a half, not quite two. It's not quite here. You notice the diamond shape that the isometric grid makes. It's also an isometric square. From corner to corner, creates that halfway mark thing. 
Now you could pretty much estimate this, um, but it can be a little confusing for some students. As I move back, remember, parallel to the depth edge or depth dimension, I find that I wind up back on a grid line. And it's halfway between the diamond that's turned this direction. Now that can be a little confusing. Let that process for a minute. As I go in and draw the only construction line that's needed for the surface on the front, and the top. and the right. Again, using construction lines. Nice and light. Very light, very easy to draw. Very easy to erase as well. All that's left at this point is for me to delineate my surface spaces and then to draw the one remaining interior edge, delineate it, and tonal shape. Because they already drew the box for me, this practice piece goes much, much faster. Remember, I'm going to rotate my paper so that I can draw near vertical lines every time, even though I'm drawing in a width or depth direction. It's easier to rotate the paper than it is to rotate my arm, my hand, or even my protractor, which is my straight edge in this case. Remember that with an object line, this is where I'm going to press just a little harder, whereas with the construction lines, I use just the weight of the pencil. There's a difference in the way that I hold the pencil. Construction, very light, very loose, not really pressing hard at all. Pencil almost flops in my hand. Whereas with an object line, I'm not going to hold it like I would if I'm writing, but I'm going to hold it a little tighter and maybe a little choked up, enough that I can press with my forefinger, with my index finger, and push it down to make that uh, delineation that I'm looking for. So there my surface spaces are done. I need to identify where this interior edge is going to be. Now, although that's on the back plane of the object, in the box, I have to look through the box to see it so we consider it an interior edge. I know it's beginning and end points here and here. That would be here on the object, here on the object. I'll connect them together to make straight line. Notice that this line is not horizontal, it's not vertical, it's not moving in depth. It is simply a non-parallel, a slanted, canted, chamfered face. I'll delineate it. The object is all but done. I need simply to apply some tonal shading. Tonal shading goes the same way. I'm going to stick with having my front face as the lightest side and my right side face as the darkest side. Remember, I'm going to leave the top and the angled uh, non-parallel slanted chamfered camfer, uh, slanted chamfered and canted face uh, so that it is blank as well. Making my front face the lightest in this case makes it easier for me. I don't have to draw as many lines. I only have to draw three layers on the right and one layer on the front. Now again, I can decide which way I want to make these layers go. On the front, I have the choice of either following my height lines or following my width lines. So I can draw either vertical lines or horizontal lines. I'm going to choose to draw horizontal lines. The object is longer in width than it is in height. So it'll make it look like it flows just a little bit better. I'll rotate the object so that I can draw these lines nice and neat. They also get applied 
to the right side face is it will be one of the three layers that I have to apply there. Now notice I've already started to open up some of that right side face. So I could immediately start picking up my pencil and moving it down here as I apply the tonal shade layer on the front. Now that's up to you. It does make it look a little more consistent if you do it this way. It lines the lines up, keeping them collinear with each other, which means that they stay in the same line. They are collinear. And it helps with consistency of their distance apart, since they're all on the same line. I've rotated my pencil there so that I get a more fine line out of it. I found that instead of having to sharpen the pencil, if I use a mechanical one, I can just rotate it and the edge on that pencil um, is a sharper point on one side after I've used it for a little bit. Okay, so the right side face is all that I really need to do now. I have to apply a vertical and a depth direction. Tonal shade line weight should be somewhere in between a construction and an object line. So a little bit of pressure, but not very dark at all. The darkness, the value of this comes into play by uh, how many layers you apply. Now right now I have one layer on the front and two layers on the right. I need to finish with the third layer moving in depth. And remember, it's not some random angle like this, but rather following the depth lines. Here, here, staying parallel to not only the rest of the tonal shade lines moving in this direction, but also staying parallel to, as much as possible, the depth lines of the object. And I'm fairly close to that. That's why I use a protractor that's clear. I can see through the protractor and be able to identify whether or not I am parallel or if I'm drawing at some random angle. Hopefully at this point you've learned that isometric means equal measure. Iso meaning equal, metric meaning measure. Notice that if I start in this corner on the isometric grid paper, I can find myself moving in depth and in width, most typical names for these, but it depends on the orientation of the object, and height. Again, depth, width, and I have height. The equal measure is in the angle. Imagine if I had a circle, which we should know at this point has 360 degrees, I can split it in three equal parts of 120 degrees. Each one of these angular measurements is 120 degrees.